What do you think are the odds that uh, there is life elsewhere in the universe? Uh, they must be high, and, and I'll tell you why. People say, well, have you found life yet? No. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean. This has been said before, and taking a cup of water, scooping up, and saying, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? Well, shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. But here's some very simple facts. I can review them in 90 seconds. You look at the formation of the Earth and the earliest sign of fossil life. Subtract a few hundred million years at the beginning of Earth when Earth was a shooting gallery. Earth was still accreting the, the, the birth materials of the solar system. It's hostile to complex chemistry over that time. Not fair to start the clock then. Wait a couple hundred million years. Now start the clock and wait around and see when you have the first signs of single-celled life. At most, 400 million years. At most, Earth has been around for four and a half billion. So Earth, without any help from us, with basic ingredients found throughout the universe, managed to create life, simple though it was. So, and Earth, one of, you know, eight planets, get over it, uh, <laughs> one, uh, one of, sorry. Earth, well, an ordinary star, uh, to suggest, and, and what, what are the ingredients of life? The number one atom in your body is hydrogen. Number two atom is oxygen, together making mostly water that's in you. Next is carbon in this order. Next is nitrogen. Next is other stuff. My favorite element, other, yeah. <laughs> you look at the universe, the number one element in the universe is hydrogen. Next is helium, chemically inert, couldn't do anything with it anyway. Next is carbon. I think I left that oxygen there. Next is oxygen. Next is nitrogen. One for one. We're not even made of odd things. The most common things in the universe are found here on Earth, and we're made of them. And carbon, one of the most chemically fertile, the most chemically fertile element on the periodic table, it's not a surprise, we're carbon-based. Life is just the extreme expression of complex chemistry. Point is, it happened relatively quickly with the most common ingredients in the universe. To now say life on Earth is unique in the universe would be inexcusably egocentric. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I would go further and say that if, if ever you meet somebody who wishes to claim that he believes or she believes that life is unique in the universe, then it would follow from that belief that the origin of life on this planet would have to be a quite stupefyingly rare and improbable event. And that would have the rather odd consequence that when chemists try to work out theories, models of the origin of life, they, what they should be looking for is a stupendously improbable theory, an implausible theory. If there was a plausible theory of the origin of life... It wouldn't then, be it. it th that's right, because, because, it would ha because then life would have to be... Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Now, maybe it, maybe it is everywhere. My, my, my hunch is that it, it, there's lots and lots of life in the universe, but it's probably, because the universe is so vast, the islands of life that there are are so spaced out that it's unlikely that any one of them will ever meet any other, which is rather sad. So, um, but I wanted to make a point that your calculation of it took only about um, 400 million years at the most for the first life to arise. Um, for the first life capable of 
broadcasting radio waves capable of being detected elsewhere in the universe, it took approximately just under four billion years. Yeah. Um, well, no, it, ab about about four, four billion, billion years. Four billion. Um, which is about half the life of I mean of the, of the that we can expect the, the, the solar system to sure. exist. Mm -hmm. um, so an important point, by the way, because we were human before we had the technology to broadcast. So if your criterion for whether a planet has intelligent life and if we are the measure of intelligence, then there could be plenty of planets out there with Roman empires and whatever else, and they're not sending radio signals. But any close enough observer would surely declare them to be intelligent. The time interval between Roman empires and radio signals is negligible compared to the total time we're talking about. So it's an interesting question how long it takes once you get language, once you get civilization, once you get culture, um, how long does it take to get radio waves? Indeed, how long does it take to get self-destructive weapons that blow the whole lot up? I mean, that, that's the next. And you're even, there's an implicit assumption that you're making inadvertently, possibly, that intelligence is an inevitable, inevitable consequence of the evolutionary record. And I, I, I'm skeptical of that, because if that were the case, what we call our intelligence would have happened multiple times in, in the fossil record, and it, it hasn't. Whereas other things have shown up plenty of times, like the, the sense of sight and locomotion. There's some rather inventive ways things can get around the world. My favorite is the snake, of course. No arms, no legs, yet it gets around just fine. It is interesting to look around the animal kingdom and, and count up the number of times that some things have have evolved. I mean, eyes several dozen times, ears um, a, quite a large number of times, echolocation, that's finding a way around by sonar, only four times. So that's bat a, and who else? a bat, whales, um, uh, and two different groups of birds, okay. um, cave dwelling birds, and, and a few rudimentary examples in some shrews and sea lions, but really four, four different times. L intelligence and language of the human kind only once, as you pointed out. Um, so it can't be that important for survival. Well, if yeah, natural selection yeah. is at work, it should have shown up many more times. You'd think so. Um, but I mean, it, it's, it's a genuinely interesting point that I think biologists haven't thought about enough, is to go around the animal kingdom counting up the number of separate arisings of something, because that does tell you something about what you might expect elsewhere in the universe. You'd expect eyes. You might expect echolocation. Um, hypodermic syringes, stingers. Um, about a couple of dozen, uh, I'm talking about independent evolutions now, if you look about spiders. Our version scorpions. of that would be called guns, yeah. yeah. About called what? Uh, our version of the hypodermic stinger would be called a gun. Yes, right? okay. To sting yeah. someone with um, so But I'm talking about an, a, something that penetrates the body and injects poison. Yeah. And, and that's, so it, that's an interesting question. And another relevant point is you look around the world at different island continents and say, how many times, how, how similar are they? You look at Australia, the Australian mammals, for example, and there are very, very powerful similarities between Australian mammals, which evolved entirely independently of mammals in South America, independently again of mammals in Asia and Africa. And so, again, that gives you a kind of a clue for how predictable evolution is. Other worlds are going to be very different, but we perhaps shouldn't write off the possibility that the Hollywood um, aliens are not, they might not be not that unimaginative. I mean, my colleague Simon Conway Morris has even suggested that there is very likely that there will be, if not humans, at least bipedal, um, big brained, language toting, hand toting, um, forward looking eyes for stereoscopy, pretty much humans. He thinks it's highly likely. He's got a religious agenda, I'm sorry to say, um, for that. Um, but but I, I, like him, I, I appreciate the power of natural selection.